the 88th Psalm. And here's what I have found. And I was with a missions organization that I'll mention more about in a moment that uh, works around the world. And around the world, there is a false teaching. It is true in our country. It is true everywhere in the world. And it's the most impactful uh, and destructive false teaching. We live in a world of false teaching and false teachers. And the thing, the Bible, but just in the New Testament, there are over 50 references just in the New Testament to false teachers. To those who say, this is God's word and I'm God's people. And maybe neither one of those things are true. They're distorting God's word, twisting it, taking an element of truth and take it away from eternal truth. Uh, worldwide, this is definitely the most common, attractive of false teachings. And it's, it's causing just wreckage and confusion and destruction of God's true biblical kingdom work. And it is the prosperity gospel. It has a very simple phrase, but it is wrecking the third world. Because it's so attractive to hear healthy, wealthy. All you have to do is believe in God and you'll be healthy and wealthy. And it's everywhere. And it's not really a gospel at all. Gospel means good news. And there is no good news in false teaching like this. But here's the weird part. We embrace it a lot. All of us. Because isn't that how you want it to work? Everything's always good. Everything's always getting better. Everything is up and to the right on the chart of life. And uh, yeah. Good things are always happening. Better things are before us. And we want it to work that way with God. The prosperity message is primarily about physical things instead of spiritual things. That's a key part of it. It's saying, I want, I believe this life is my best life. Right now is my best life. And there's not a lot of view toward eternity and toward things forever. It's all about here and right now. And it's about physical stuff and material stuff overwhelmingly. And the idea that God's main job in, on planet earth is to make me happy and to make me comfortable. And that's the prosperity gospel. And by the way, happy and comfortable as I have defined it. I want God to fine tune it to my preferences. The only problem with that is the Bible declares a relationship to God is a dramatically different thing than that. It's not about us, which prosperity gospel makes us the center of the universe it's about God, and God's concern is not for, I know this is a weird thing for a lot of you to grasp, but I'm telling you, this rubs against us in all kinds of ways because we fight against this truth from God's Word, but God's concern is much more for our holiness to make us, mold us into the image of Christ than it is for our happy, slappy preferences in life. So God's working a bigger plan and a more eternal plan than that. And we see this, we see this in the great Bible characters as they go through things, through things, and sometimes slam into things in life that are difficult and challenging and painful. The Apostle Paul wrote this, knowing that God is much more interested in the development of our character than he is in how comfortable we are. We love our comfort. God loves our character to be like Christ. So Paul writes, we also rejoice in our afflictions. You say, well, he should see a counselor. He is rejoicing in rotten stuff. That's crazy. But he says, Here, here's why I can rejoice even when things are hard. Because we know that affliction produces endurance. Endurance produce, produces proven character. Proven character produces hope. And this hope will not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has, He has given us. So, here's the issue. Is we say, okay, God's God. I'm not. All this stuff. Sometimes bad things happen to us folks who like to think of ourselves as good people. And, but here's the other part. I have prayed big, bold prayers. And I've seen God answer big, bold prayers. 
swinging for the fences kind of prayers. I have nowhere to turn and nowhere to go but to the Lord, and I'm asking Him for big things. I've prayed those kind of prayers for some of you. I'm asking for all of it, not just a piece of the puzzle. I'm asking God to do something miraculous. And here's the thing. I've seen relationships restored. I've seen bodies healed. Many of you can give testimony to that kind of stuff in your own prayer life, in your own journey with God. You have seen him do those miraculous, glorious things. And I believe anything God has ever done, he can still do. Anything he did in this book, he can do in Allen, Texas today. So I believe all those things absolutely true. But what about the times when that's not how God does things? And that's where the rub comes in this. I'm always going to ask for it. But when it doesn't happen that way, how do we process that? What do we do with it? What's God up to? And when, when you don't get a good report from the doctor, when you don't get the job, when you don't get the promotion, when the relationship doesn't come to restoration, do you still say at the end of that journey, when it gets to there and you've hit the wall, do you still say, when you prayed and it didn't come to pass, God is good. Hashtag blessed. Do you say it when God doesn't do it the way you want him to, you wish he would? I told you I was going to tell you a story today, and it's really not as long as it's going to feel. <laughs> you guys have been great to pray for me and ask me about my, my eyes. Some of you know my story and some of you don't. So here's the whirlwind tour of my journey because this, is, uh, this flows out of this. And many of you have been asking about it. So what's your status and where are things? And so I want to tell you. In February 2018, February last year, uh, I, I went with a group of people from our church. And we went to Busia, Kenya to share the gospel. There are a lot of things you can do on a mission trip. But for our church, a part of our core DNA is we want, we want to tell people about Jesus in Allen, Texas, in Collin County, to the ends of the earth. We want to do that. And so we've partnered up for a long time, long before I got here, with an organization called International Commission. International Commission uh, has partners around the world. And so what we do is we partner with local churches to share the gospel with their friends, their neighbors, their family members. And so what happens is we... We go and uh, have uh, 14 of us from our church. We'll join with other Americans in Zambia next month, and we'll be doing the same thing. So I'll be assigned to a church or a couple of us to a church. And out of, you know, I think there are 18 churches on this project in, Zamb in Lusaka, Zambia, and be with that church all week, going with them to share the gospel, to help open doors for the good news of Jesus. And uh, it's such a rich spiritual soil in Africa just now. We'll see great things taking place. That's the exciting part of going to that place. And so what we do, we, we partner up and uh, we seek to share the gospel, train the people there to share their faith more effectively, encourage them forward in uh, disciple making, and then making people who make disciples. So that's what we're up to. Uh, this Last year, that was my 10th time to get to step on the African continent doing something like that, which I, I never, a guy growing up in Victoria, Texas, I, I never imagined I'd, I'd see the things I've seen, be the places I've been. By the way, International Commission, uh, since January 1st, and th that's the slow season because it's rainy season in a lot of parts of the world where they work, but uh, since January, they've had 136,000 adults make commitments to Christ. 136,000 adults, and that's the slow season. Summer and fall are when it's most intensive, uh, and uh, in the work they do, sometimes Americans are involved, sometimes just people from one side of Kenya going to the other side of Kenya to do a mission trip, and we helped to sponsor, we've helped, many of you have helped to sponsor some of those, those efforts. Last year, uh, 3.4 million people came to Christ through the work of International Commission. This is an incredible ministry. I want to challenge you to give to them and, incur and be a part of these, these sorts of works. Now, at this point in my ministry, 10 times into the continent, I've, I've got a lot of friends in Africa. I have a couple of them I'm going to hear from every week. I have one, uh, David, 
he keeps up with the time difference enough, he'll, uh, Facebook Messenger popped me at 15 after 12 and said, how'd the service go today? Uh, we're back and forth all the time about any variety of things. I have, I have lots of friends in Africa. One of my friends I've worked with multiple times, and that was from the February last year trip. So, uh, and goodness, we're going to be together forever and eternity. Might, might as well get to know each other now, right? So our week in Busia, the format is, you know, we arrive, we get settled into our little hotel, and then we go to a central church that has, is big enough to accommodate uh, the team. And we've got an American team. We've got people from other parts of Africa who come to join in, and the church leaders at the eight, you know, this year, the 18 churches we partnered with. We all get together, and we have this rally. And this is a real heartbreaker for our team going this year, as it was last year, because they're going to go, we're going to go all the way to Lusaka, Zambia, and in the opening rally, the sermon is me. They went all the way to Africa to hear me preach a sermon. So, boy, that's a kick in the head. Well, uh, so what we do, we all get together. And it's kind of, here we go. We're going to go out and share the gospel. We're going to pray together. We're going to encourage each other. And then, uh, you know, that's my role in this. And expecting great things from the Lord. So I preached the opening rally and uh, met some friends that I haven't seen in a long time from different parts of Africa. And we shared a meal with those believers there. And then we went back to the hotel. Uh, still, you know, time zones and all that's kind of crazy. It's a bit of seven, eight hour difference. And, uh, we did some more training with our crew, did some cultural things to keep in mind in uh, your interactions because Sunday morning, we'd be going to whatever church we'd been assigned to and sharing then for the rest of the week with them. So uh, we were excited. I was excited and uh, had met my pastor I'd be working with in uh, Kenya. And I went to bed. Now, when I don't know about the rest of you traveling, but I go east changing time zones, especially seven or eight hours. I'm just kind of scrambled. I do pretty good when I get home. But, and you're excited too. And I don't sleep well on a plane. So I'm pretty sleep deprived. But I'm just laying there awake in this hotel room. I was by myself because nobody wants to stay with me. And I, just wide eyed. And finally I fell asleep at some point after midnight. And I woke up one or two o'clock. I thought, oh, please be seven o'clock. But it was not. Because I glanced over, cut my eyes over, and looked at my little clock on the little nightstand in this little uh, hotel room. And I knew something was wrong. Not with my clock, but with me. Because when I cut my eyes over, I had this lightning bolt effect. It's an it's a arc, like a lightning bolt, that shoots from here to here around my right eye. And I had a couple of retinal tears and I knew that that was one of the symptoms of such and uh, had those repaired and it wasn't a big deal and uh, unless you're in Kenya it's a big deal so oh man I'm just freaked out but because of the time difference I was able to communicate with Rhonda quickly and say hey can you get some folks praying for me and thinking about this and what my options are and what I need to do and fortunately, they didn't turn off all the electricity at the hotel, which sometimes happens if you're in a place in Africa. So I still had Wi-Fi in the middle of the night because everybody else was mostly asleep, I guess. Uh, I had really good Wi-Fi. So Rhonda began on this end, and uh, I didn't sleep. But now I'm up on most of the night and go, went on to breakfast and told, uh, told folks. And You know, the great part about taking a bunch of people with you from church is that church is still with you. And so, man, they so graciously prayed for me and encouraged me. And having, having my church family with me was uh, really important in such times. It always is wherever I am. But we, we went on to breakfast, and I let leadership folks, uh, African and American leadership on the trip, know what was going on with me and what we were working on. Meanwhile, it's Sunday morning. I got no answers. There's nothing I can do. And so I just... I put on my sport coat that I, I got that I left with a pastor, and it's hard to find whatever the 44 long uh, African pastor sometimes, but I found one. And uh, put on my tie. We get wear a tie on Sunday, not any other days on a trip like that. And 
I took off to this church, to that one, uh, Tanga Kona. And those are the folks I got to worship with. It was awesome. It's a dirt floor, homemade benches, a lot of people just sitting on mats in the floor. And uh, that's where I preached on Sunday. And uh, it is such a blessing to be with these folks. They worship with such enthusiasm. We had a homemade drum as the only instrumentation we had. They got after it, and I jumped in there with them. And I'm not telling you I danced, but I'm not telling you I didn't. And, and it's not pretty in anybody's culture, I'll tell you that too. Uh, you see, there's some uh, broken bricks off on the left because they're building... You could see through cracks everywhere. It, it wouldn't survive many rainy seasons. And so what you get in uh, Tangacona is uh, they're building a building right next door to this building. And as they can find money and as they can make their own bricks, they, they start going up. And they were about six feet up on their bricks. And they, uh, they are now in that building uh, a year later. I'm proud of them. I had a great time. Young pastor. He'd taken over for a much older pastor. And he was so excited to... To, to have us there. Then at, we had lunch together, which is, which is a blast, uh, out at the church, out in the gr- dinner on the grounds at Tanga Kona. Then uh, we went out into the community. We, I said, I want to start immediately. I don't, I don't need any rest today. And so I strap on my jungle gym hat, and here we go down trails, and we had a bunch of people give their lives to Christ out there in the Tanga Kona community. And it's just a great launch to the week. And, and I came back to the hotel. I have no pain with this eye thing. I just know what's going on. I came back to the hotel. Uh, Jeff Wood such a great resource. He helped, uh, helped Rhonda out in researching, okay, what's actually available? Nairobi is a big city. And Jeff finally figured out, well, that there, there is a place there, a clinic, and First world doctors rotate through there, and, but still we just can't be sure about the equipment but completely. They say they can do retinal stuff, but man, that's a weird deal. What it finally came around to was the symptom that I had is true for retinal terror, but it's also true for a detachment. So then I start thinking, okay, well, that's my answer, I think, of what I need to do. I mean, I spent the whole night praying, oh, God, you got to heal me of this. I came all the way to Kenya to tell people about Jesus. You're not going to send me home. Or sideline me on this? Surely not. Um, but then we got down to, if it's a detachment, the procedure to fix that would involve something that would, that would require me to not be able to fly for three to four months. I love visiting Africa. <laughs> I do not want to live in Nairobi uh, for three to four months. So... Uh, we, we started working on that. Uh, it was just a little while later. It, it's fascinating. It was, I'm in, it's 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning now going into Monday. And I'm on the phone with Jeff. And then I'm on the phone with David Smith. And David Smith says, okay, Chad, I figured it out. This is the fastest way I can get you to Dallas. And uh, I said, uh, okay, go ahead and book it. So I got up uh, Monday morning, got, to, got down. We worked out the one detail we had to work out there to get me to where I needed to be because all I had to do was get to the regional airport by 11 o'clock, which was about three and a half hours away on a bus. So I got a translator, and we jumped on the bus, and here we go. And we're, we're bouncing along, open air, a lot of dust, going through a narrow, narrow highway and little villages, and because we've got to get to that regional airport. I got to the regional airport. There is nobody at the gate. That place is vacant. There's only a couple of flights a day, and this is one of them. And there's nobody there. I thought, oh, man, but there's still a plane here. I'm sure hoping it's mine. Finally, somebody said, oh, you're the, you're the American we're waiting for. <laughs> Glad you waited for me. I've got to get to Nairobi, or I'm in a terrible way on this whole plan. So got on the plane uh, and made it to Nairobi. So in Nairobi... Here's the, here's the flight plan. i got to get to Dubai, which is seven hours in the wrong direction. However, getting to Dubai is still the fastest way to get me back to Dallas. There's a direct flight from Dubai to Dallas. So this is my, this is my flight plan. So I, <laughs> I get to uh, Nairobi, 
and I think, okay, I had no air conditioning on that bus. I'm pretty well sweated through. I would like to find air conditioning, and I know that part of this terminal in Nairobi has air. And so I want to get to there. So I walk up to these two guys at the, I, I, I'm familiar with Nairobi's airport, so that helps. I get to the terminal. It's a big circle. There's a central green. I cut across, dragging a bag and carrying a backpack. And I walk up to the counter where these two guys are standing there in their image uniforms. I would like to get a flight. Get, I'd like to go ahead and book, uh, get my ticket and you know, get checked in. And they said, oh, we can only do that two hours before your flight leaves. And I'm the only person there. It's just me and these two guys. And so I said, okay. So I sat down in a chair about this far away from the desk. <laughs> and I waited for an hour and a half. And I sat there and sweat, because it's not air conditioned here. Sweat's just rolling off, dripping off. It's hitting the concrete down below me. And I wait. And then finally, when the clock strikes two hours, they're like, okay, welcome. Can we help you, sir? I've <laughs> been sitting there for an hour and a half just looking at them. Uh, so uh, they, they get me, and I get into the airport in Nairobi, and it's a familiar airport. It's a fun airport to walk through, and the things to at least see and do, and it's air-conditioned. And I, I slept for about an hour, uh, finishing out the rest of my layover in Nairobi. And then I got on that Emirates flight. And Emirates, Emirates is a great, great airline. And it took me to Dubai. Well, Dubai, I arrived at around 1 o'clock, 1.30 in the morning. Because their flights, you've got to pick the cooler time of day. And it has to do with your lift and all that stuff. Uh, and Dubai's airport is just enormous. It's such a hub for so much of the world. And uh, but in Dubai, you get off on the tarmac, you walk down the stairs, and, and uh, what you have to do is, uh, like they have, they have all these buses. So you climb off the airport, you climb off the plane in Dubai, there's just some guy standing out there in the dark with a sign that says, if you're going to any of these places, you need to be on my bus, and there are multiple buses to route you to all the different terminals. So I stand there. And this is great for me. I haven't slept in like 36 hours. And I'm, uh, it's the middle of the night. Oh, yeah, and my retina's a mess. And I'm trying to read this thing in the dark anyway. Somehow, man, the good, good Lord took care of me. I got on the right bus and got to the right terminal. When I arrived in the terminal, I get, I get another message from David Smith because he's tracking me. And he says, hey, there's a free shower in your terminal between gates 35 and 36. Now, I recognize I sweated all the way through my clothes on the bus ride. And then I sweated through my clothes again in the Nairobi airport. And I have sweated through myself because it's about a 20-minute tour on an unair conditioned bus. It's about 110 degrees at 1.30 in the morning in Dubai. So I'm compassionate enough to know I have to sit next to somebody on this plane. And I do care about them enough to try to make this better. So I made my way through that airport and I got a Coke and I found something to eat and I made my way to that spot where eight knocked that down. I'm taking that shower and I got to the shower closed for repairs. <laughs> so, well, that's just dandy. So, uh, I went to the far end of the terminal, and there's a area, nobody is waiting for flights down there, and I just made myself at home in that restroom and did the best I could, and I had my change of clothes in my backpack, you know, just emergency, and at least I, I suited up with new, new stuff and burned the other things, uh, rightly so, and I waited in the airport for my flight. So it's a process, you start up top, then you go down below, and there's lots of levels of security at uh, that airport. And then I climbed on my plane, and uh, I was sitting next to a young guy from Dallas. Uh, he'd been visiting family in India, and so he's coming home again, and so this is halfway point sort of for him. 60, now it's only 16 hours to home from Dubai. Uh, and so uh, we, we sit down together, and he's a great guy. He's a great seatmate. We're at the back of this monstrous plane of 400 and whatever passengers, 
And I'm on the aisle, and he's next to me. So it's just a, two, just a two-seater back at the very back. It's a great seat for me, typically, because I need to get up and walk around, make sure my back's not going to lock up on me. And so I'm just right there. The other part about real estate on a plane is that I'm right next to the restroom. Isn't that handy? In fact, it was so handy that I could sit there, and if someone came out of the restroom and didn't close the door, I didn't even have to lean over. I just did this. By the time you get to the 16-hour mark, you really don't want that real estate anymore, but that's uh, for another day. So I, I didn't sleep a lot still on the plane. Rhonda had made the appointment, and I got back to DFW about 11 o'clock. On, this is the, the math of this. On Monday, I left, I left Busia, Kenya, which is 200, about 200 meters from the Ugandan border. It's as far west as you can go in Kenya. It's a border crossing town. I left there about 7.30 Monday morning, and I'm arriving in Dallas somehow at 11 o'clock on, 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 on Monday morning. That, that Monday was one of the longest Mondays I've ever had in my whole life. And I'm just flying around the world trying to get there. Well, see, so, you know, I arrive in DFW. I uh, picked up the airport and uh, took a shower. Oh, man. I felt like I needed to be hosed off in the yard before I even did that. Then uh, I was in the doctor's office at 2 o'clock. And he said, you don't have a tear. Your retina has detached. We've got to get you into surgery first thing in the morning. So... Uh, Seven, seven o'clock on Tuesday, uh, they're slapping me with an IV and putting me out so that they can uh, insert this uh, gas bubble into my eye that maintains the integrity of the eye to wait for that uh, detachment to heal. Now, uh, since then, I've had... It's been a wild journey. Uh, that was, you know, February last year. I've had a few other tears. And the detachment surgery left behind this membrane that they had to go back in. And, I mean, it was a IV and put me out and repair it. And uh, it, it left me with some permanent damage. My other eyes where I've had the additional tears. And so if, if I was left with just one eye either direction, uh, I'd just... I'd be really in a bad way. Uh, fortunately, the way God's made us, uh, it's aggravating, but I can see uh, with both eyes open uh, fairly well. Uh, reading is better than other things, and I'm glad reading because I do a lot of reading. In fact, I didn't mention this in the children's sermon. Bought this Bible January 1st. I started reading it. I finished. I, I've got every page in this book marked. This is my new preaching Bible. I wanted to mark it up quick. Took me five months to read through my whole Bible. What have you been doing with your life this year? I'm doing it with these eyes. So you got no excuses. That was free. You know, in this journey, I'm telling you, I appreciate your support and your encouragement. And I have prayed big, bold prayers through this. And today... Barring some incredible miracle of God, what I've got today is as good as it's going to get. That we're going to try uh, something uh, late, late this month to see if there's a, another something, but there does not appear to be a good solution to what I've got. What I've found is that God is gracious in His provisions He's provided a couple of choices. I could curl up in the fetal position and uh, lament my losses and stay stuck. Or I can embrace God's grace and adjust to my new normal and press on. And that's what it comes down to in a lot of these things that don't get tied up with a bow. And we're making those decisions all the time. Uh, my months uh, have been filled with ups and downs and just fear. What if I lose my left eye what if my right eye goes down completely then then what am I going to do and uh, I prayed and prayed and trusted and trusted and I finally got to a spot where if it ever gets any better than this I found peace with the Lord through through this process and and then I started making adjustments because I hadn't up until then because I was just pulling against it 
and I changed all the settings on my phone, changed settings on my computer, changed settings on my tablet. I, somebody said, can you still drive? And I said, as far as I know, uh, <laughs> um, uh, I'm uh, just Mr. Magoo in my way around town, you know, and sidewalks and yards and wherever it is, but I'm happy. Uh, I don't, have you ever hit anybody? Not that I know of. Uh, uh, no, but I choose when I drive, I choose where I drive, uh, those kind of things. But it's, it's an, you know, that's a tough adjustment for a self-sufficient guy to have to make. And so that is my story leading up to today. Now, I want to read to you uh, the 88th Psalm. I'm going to read the whole thing. And I want you to listen to these words. This is, this is one crazy, powerful story. Lord God of my salvation... I cry out before you day and night. May my prayer reach your presence. Listen to my cry. I have had enough troubles. My life is near Sheol. I am counted among those going down to the pit. I'm like a man without strength, abandoned among the dead. I feel like the slain lying in the grave whom you no longer remember and who are cut off from your care. You put me in the lowest part of the pit, in the darkest places, in the depths. Your wrath weighs heavily on me. You've overwhelmed me with your waves. There's one of those, Selah. Stop and think about that. You have distanced my friends from me. You've made me repulsive to them. I am shut in and can't go out. My eyes are worn out from crying. Lord, I cry out to you all day long. I spread out my hands to you. Do you work wonders for the dead? I mean, do departed spirits rise up to praise you? Will, will your faithful love be declared in the grave, your faithfulness in Abaddon? Will your wonders be known in the darkness or your righteousness in the land of oblivion? Verse 13, but I call to you for help, Lord. In the morning, my prayer meets you. Lord, why do you reject me? Why do you hide your face from me? From my youth, I've been suffering in near death. I suffer your horrors. I am desperate. Your wrath sweeps over me. Your terrors destroy me. They surround me like water all day long. They close in on me from every side. Verse 18. You have distanced loved one and neighbor from me. Darkness is my only friend. That is one of the most dismal things in all the Bible. The 88th Psalm. Darkness is my only friend. Psalm 88 is just a whole lot of raw expression to God. And that last verse just says, sometimes God intervenes. Sometimes God does work miracles. But in a lot of things in life, God's just not going to wrap it up with a bow. The story isn't going to be, and they lived happily ever after. That sometimes, that's true too. And it does not in any way negate the love, the grace, and the power of God when it happens that way. You know, the, the last uh, darkness is my only friend. This is where it comes from. Hello, darkness, my old friend. This is where it comes from. And darkness is a terrible friend. What do you do when the circumstances don't change and the darkness doesn't lift and it doesn't get any easier in the journey? Arthur John Gossip once said, and I've kept this for a long time, some people, when belief comes hard, fling away the Christian faith altogether. And uh, I had a conversation uh, over the weekend. I was at a meeting in Grapevine and group of Christian leaders and one of them was telling me about a spouse who just I'm done and threw away any faith any trust in God Arthur John Gossip says and by the way he had experienced tremendous tremendous loss the depths of loss and he said uh, some people uh, fling away the Christian faith all, the, all together and he says Fling away for what? Where would you go to ever find a hope except to the Lord? How else could this be managed? Now, I found this. Life is a mystery, and much of what happens in life is certainly beyond uh, our understanding. 
I don't, you know, I mean, the word why occurs over and over again in the Psalms. They're asking the same things we do, and it's okay to ask. I don't understand why it seems like some people that just, they don't love God, and they don't care about anything or anybody, but their life's going great. And people who genuinely are leaning into the relationship to God and love Him with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength are in a struggle. I don't know why some people get cancer, and I don't know why some people's relationships uh, just dissolve. And I, you know, I don't know why bad news comes, and bad news comes, and bad news comes to some. Why some people are in constant pain, and this, these other folks, trouble-free lives. And even if it was explained, I don't think we'd be really satisfied with it. And for me, I had to get to a spot where I just said, I'm just going to have to trust God knows what he's doing. And I don't know where the road goes from here even, but I know he's good. It brought a lot of humility to a self-sufficient guy's life. The, uh, the young Hebrew fellows, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you remember, they're, they're not going to bow down to this idol and so they're going to be thrown into a fiery furnace this from the book of Daniel and this is their statement as they said okay then you're, we're throwing you into this furnace if you don't do this and they said you know if this be so our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of your hand O king but if not be it known to you, O king, we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image you've set up. We believe he can. But if he doesn't, it's not going to change our faith response to God. Uh, one, one of the things that I think about in the book of Acts is uh, they arrest, they're in Jerusalem, they arrest Peter for preaching the gospel. He's thrown into prison, planning to kill him. And God miraculously delivers him. The church is praying. It's a great story, but the paragraph just in front of it is the other side of this coin. Because the paragraph just in front of it says they arrested James, the brother of John, and they killed him. They executed him, and it made the religious leaders, the Jewish leaders, so happy in Jerusalem. That's why they arrested Peter. Church didn't pray any less for another key uh, leader in this early church, they prayed for James just like they prayed for, prayed for Peter. Peter miraculously delivered. James laid down his life for the cause of Christ. I love the Psalms, and I think they're in the Bible to keep us honest about life. The Psalms, you just have the nitty-gritty of the Christian faith, the life relationship to God on display chapter after chapter, verse after verse. And it's common to find the, the, the writer of the different psalms, and there's several different authors, just crying out to God. You got to help me. You got to deliver me. I don't understand why bad things are happening to good people, why bad people seem to be doing great. I don't understand why this, I, my enemies all around me, and they're crying out to God and asking for help. But most of the psalms, the interesting part, even when they're, they're expressing some kind of doubt at some level, They get to the end and they tend, tend to land the plane in a positive way. I want to give you an example. I'm going to run through rapidly the first 10 Psalms. The first Psalm, the way the wicked will perish. Oh, that's just the way that goes. Second Psalm, blessed are those who take refuge in him. Third Psalm, salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be on your people. Fourth Psalm, for you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. Fifth, for you bless the righteous, O Lord. You cover him as a favor, as, a favor as with a shield. Sixth Psalm, all my enemies will be ashamed and greatly troubled. Seventh Psalm, I will sing praise in the name of the Lord, the Most High. Eighth Psalm, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. The ninth Psalm, let the nations know that they are but men. Tenth Psalm, so that man who is of the earth may strike terror no more. And you see the pattern. It ends with something, something a little refreshing for a guy like me. That I see it, and it's going to end well. It's going to land well. The wicked are going to receive justice. God's going to receive praise. The author of the psalm has comfort, and he has a sense of safety in the arms of God. And, 
And the Psalms are honest about how you feel. And man, you feel what you feel. But in the end, God and his people win. And out of all the things you talk about in the book of Revelation, you can get on a whole lot of sidebars. But the, the core message is, we win. We win. Then, you got this crazy 88 psalm. And he goes through complaining, crying out to God. This is wrong. This isn't right. This is bad. This is falling apart. Hello, darkness, my old friend. And that's where he lands it. And sometimes, sometimes that's where it lands. Why would God ever put something so hopeless in this book? You know, why doesn't the writer of the 88th find peace and refuge and comfort at the end of the story like, like the, most of the rest of these folks do? Well, because if you live long enough, you're going to get to a seemingly hopeless situation where it just you can't fix it. And it, it may not ever get better than it is. And... You don't think anything good can result. I mean, so unlike like the, the, the fourth Psalm, that guy, you have put more joy in my heart than they have when their grain and new wine abound. I will both lie down and sleep in peace for you alone, Lord. Make me live in safety. Wow. What a happy life that guy has. But then you take those people in that mass shooting this weekend. Where was their safety? And why didn't it work there? And why is it sometimes God does and sometimes he doesn't? And that's where we, we, we wrestle with the problem of pain and suffering in the world. What do you do in those moments when your world comes crashing down? It seems like hope and getting better is lost. And, and you know, if you live long enough, you're going to say goodbye to, to loved ones. And it, you don't know what the future holds. And sometimes your dreams and your plans just get wrecked. And one day you face a Psalm 88 moment. And for all of us at different levels, it's going to come. And if you're not in one of those right now, you're going to know somebody in your circles of influence around you. And they're going through it. And you need to be, you need to be ready for this with them. Uh, three quick things to think about life through the lens of God's Word, His truth, the gospel itself. Three ways to think about this during the Psalm 88 moments. Here's the first one. Cry out to God and don't stop. And be bold in it. And you keep asking for big things. And keep swinging for the fences. And where, the old song, where would I go but to the Lord? Where else, who else could change this? Who could make, make a difference in this? When you're faced, when God's people have been faced with tragedy and crisis and hurt, they cry out to God. And don't be afraid to ask him why. He may or may not tell you. Sometimes I've seen the why part of crisis and difficulty. Most of the time, it's just okay to ask because these guys did. It's okay. God can handle big questions. Second thing, draw near to Jesus. Jesus is a much better friend than darkness. And that's my experience. He's a much better friend. He faced the harshest realities of life. Uh including uh, everything that took place on the cross and my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He knows what you're going through. He sympathizes with you in your suffering. Third thing, reach out for help. And this is just stop faking spiritual strength. You know, I know we come in here and we sit down. You do the same thing in your group sometimes. You, you sit there and it is unraveling in you and around you. And you just sit there with your Sunday clothes on and pretend like all is well. I'm good. And we don't ever just say, here's what's going on in my life. I was in a meeting with a group of church leaders over the weekend uh, from churches all over the country. It's a board meeting for International Commission, the group I was talking about. And one of the people said, was doing a devotional and said you know I got to tell you what's going on in my life and 
This is first thing in yesterday morning. But that night, everything went bad for her. And a lot of things she was really counting on just came crashing down. And, and it was awful. And she cried and we cried. And we're not a big group. It was like 12 people in the room. And people just started firing off. Let me tell you what's going on with me. Let me tell you my story. Let me tell you what's happening to my family. When things are difficult, you do not want to do that by yourself. That's why God's, he's created us for community. And you, you need, just need to say, uh, next, I told the first hour, I don't know what kind of collateral damage I left with Sunday school this hour. But next Sunday, you can do this. Go into your class and just hijack the class and say, hey, instead of doing this Bible story, can I be honest and just tell you what's going on in my life? Because I need some people around me. I need some people praying for me. We need to be that kind of people because they're folks that are suffering in silence. And that should just never be so among God's people. And if one person will go first, everybody would be okay. Psalm 88 is, uh, in spite of the way it ends, darkness my only friend. It's a pretty hopeful song. And the reason is because it's in this hope-filled book. And it's that context that gives me hope that you can face the darkest realities of your life because God is on his throne, mighty to deliver, mighty to save. Jesus is your closest friend and the Holy Spirit is powerful in this world. And you got you to gotta get to a spot in relationship to God where you say, if everything was stripped away, everything was stripped away, and I had nothing left but Jesus. Would Jesus be enough for me? Many of you can give testimony. I've, I've been trying to learn stuff in the last year. I don't want to waste anything. And if this is my journey, I sure didn't want to waste this. And I'm still learning and I've waited a long time to talk about this at this level because I wasn't done learning. But here are just a few things at this point in the game that I've learned. I've learned some new humility uh, again, I'm a self-sufficient person, and I, 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 I drive, I'm a hard-driving kind of individual like a lot of you, and uh, I've learned some new humility. I've learned to have a different level of compassion for other people. God's taught me some lessons about prayer, because I certainly pray differently now than I did a year ago, and uh, I read my Bible differently than I did uh, a year ago. I'm seeing things I hadn't seen before because of the journey I'm in. I'm learning that uh, if your circumstances don't change, that may be an indicator that God's waiting for me to change. You've got to think about that part. If, if I'm praying for it and I'm wanting it, but everything else doesn't change, God's probably waiting on something to shift in my heart. The other thing is, when you hit that wall and you feel so stuck... I, can, I have a choice to make. I can curse the darkness or I can look to God, to my Savior Jesus Christ, who is the light of the world. And again, I can despair or I can walk in my new reality, find whatever my new normal is and seek to be faithful in the next season of my life. And if I can make that choice... Instead of living with fear, I'm going to live, I'm going to live by faith. And that's my story. And what is your story? And what are you going to do next? Just know, our God is a great God.